like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. But there's something about that Worshiping at home, and we invite you to go to driftlessministry.org and download the bulletin for this week so you can follow along and have the words for the songs. We are appreciative of the fact that so many of you have tuned in and are, I mean, I've been greeted in Walmart, hey, I've seen you on TV, which is just like phenomenal that we are able to spread the word. My name is Pastor Pam Harkema. I serve at Liberty Pole New Hope, and we are here at Retreat and recording our worship for you today. Um, if you have a prayer request at any time, you may certainly text it to me at, at uh, my phone number, which is on the bulletin, or um, you can find it on our website. Wednesday, FPRC will meet here at retreat um, in a socially distanced meeting in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, next Sunday, after both retreat and New Hope services, we will have a short board meeting, and we will to discuss how we are going to be continuing into the fall with our worship services. Liberty Pole is continuing to pause, but they will be having a reopening committee meeting next week, so um, uh, uh, the following week, to um, discuss their situation. So uh, lots of things going on right now. Even though we are paused, we, in, in many ways, we are still the Church of Jesus Christ. So with that, I invite us to stand for the greeting of the collective. God is good. All, all the time. time. All the time. God is good. And our centering thoughts for our service today. While we are waiting, God waits with us. God's promises are both now and yet to come. Wait and see. And our opening hymn is one we normally sing in the fall, but I, I call your attention especially to the second verse of this hymn, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. Come ye thankful people, come, raise the song of harvest home, all is safely gathered in, ere the winter storms begin. God our Maker doth provide for our wants to be shall come and shall take the harvest 
attention to today. Uh, First Marty Zitzner continues in hospice and um, she is still doing okay for now and um, Tom is, uh, is, we're just, we're just all praying for a good miracle for Marty and her, in her healing, in her care, in her, um, in her life right now. And so she's, she's doing okay but she's, um, I believe she's nearing the end. Sonia Boland also in hospice and is um, we, we just we really want to lift her. She's a relative of people here. She's a member at the Lutheran Church down the street. Uh, just a wonderful community person, young and and with cancer, and just really want to pray for Sonia. Harry Fox was was in the hospital and is now back at the at Vernon Manor. Again, he is also looking. Uh, he's 97 now, so he's looking towards the end of his his career here too, and and looking at the first steps of his next journey. So many people who are reaching a time of transition in their life. Bev Kaylee continues to have um, uh, recovery from her heart issues. Gloria Warmuth had to be hospitalized following one of her treatments. That, uh, you see, it was Tuesday she went in, and they were not able to do the last two treatments because her skin was so badly burned from the radiation. So they kept her in the hospital for a couple of days, and they modified her pain medication. We're going to try from Monday and Tuesday to have those last two um, treatments so she can be done with this. She's so looking forward to having this in the rearview mirror. So, um, My friend, Pastor Norman Mark, I... I included him. He's one of my friends from the Native American Circle, and I, he, I preached and um, mentioned him and had his picture in our sermon a um, couple of, it was on Native American Ministry Sunday back in April. His son, uh, OJ, died from the COVID virus, and he was, um, Norman is in the Four Corners area in Arizona, and his son, OJ, was in Texas, so they were transporting him back so they could have the celebration of life. But uh, O.J. was in his late 20s, so and it's, it's just sad. It's just very sad. Um, again, uh, many people in the area we want to remember, um, of course, Peyton. Uh, we've been praying for Peyton and uh, the Bargabos granddaughter, and she is... Uh, she is recovering from the, the dog bites that she received and hopefully will be, be on the mend. Um, Jana Thu is having her last uh, radiation treatment tomorrow, so excited about that. Um, many people in our congregation, we want to really lift and, and keep it close at our heart. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. or are 
at the end of their life or have passed, Lord. And all of our prayers and all of our concerns for these folks can we, we express it to you and, and we know, Lord, that you're already in those situations. You're already holding their hand as they are struggling with this. Whatever it is. We pray to you to remind ourselves that we put our trust in you. We pray to you to remind us that we too are caring people. And that our care goes beyond a simple phrase. We take time to reflect on each person. And time to reflect on the impact their life has had in this area and on us. And we are so grateful, Lord, that we've had the opportunity to cross paths and, and to walk beside each of these people. We have great joy as we celebrate together in worship, and we have great joy that our message reaches beyond these four walls, and that we have the privilege to carry your word out, to share it with others. And we are grateful for the opportunities you give us to do just that. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe in the rains and the storms. Thank you for the warm weather that causes the corn to sprout and grow and come to fruition. That we are in that season of growth, Lord. Growing in nature and growing in our spirit. we disconnect from the busyness of life, Lord, we can focus on the things that are truly important. What a gift this respite time has been for us. Lord, as we draw together to praise you, we offer the words that your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I have a real special joy today in that my daughter Madeline and her fiancé Chris have been here with me for this weekend. And uh, Madeline, you know, she loves to sing. And so whenever she comes, that's part of, she has to pay the piper. And so I'm, I'm glad that she is willing to come and sing for us today. It's a beautiful song by Lauren Daigle called Trust in You.
steken we hebben. As you might have expected from our display today, our parable today is from the book of Matthew, our gospel from as we were picking up where we left off last week. Remember last week we talked about the sower who just randomly throws seed around. And today we are talking about the wheat and the tares. So Jesus told them another parable. This is the first of the kingdom of heaven parables. So um, we'll be looking at some more of those. Kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you want, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. And he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the wheat in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the peoples of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our friend Debbie Grove from the New Hope Church has several beautiful gardens. There are flowers and a variety of pastas by her side door, a row of flowering shrubs on the opposite side of the property, and in the backyard there is an expansive vegetable garden, which we were fortunate to pick some squash out of last night. But the garden that seemed to occupy most of Debbie's and ultimately Charlie's efforts this year was the 24-foot-long strawberry bed. It is adjacent to some raspberry plants, and as you can imagine, the deep roots of those plants sent runners to take root in the strawberry bed. Plus, it seemed like every form of invasive weed that you can think of jumped in there and immediately secured a spot to thrive, to choke out the nutrients and space for the desired berries. Debbie spent hours weeding the ground and cultivating the soil, and Charlie built this raised bed with a deep base and a metal barrier between that and the raspberries to keep the roots out. Finally, she covered that bed with straw to protect the fragile plants and help keep the undesirable. So far this year, I think eight berries have been harvested, in spite of the enormous effort that was put into the project. But Debbie has a great deal of hope for the future. We just don't like the way things look when there are a lot of weeds in our gardens, do we? And Debbie is not the only one who gives a lot of time to garden maintenance. <laughs> Doesn't it seem that weeds can continue to thrive in any condition? And they can continue to choke out our precious berries and flowers and herbs and vegetables. Well, Jesus uses that familiar image of weeds in the field to remind us that there are weeds all around us. And yanking out the weeds is not the way to salvation. Jesus says, let the weeds be. But why? Clearly, there's 
evil growing right in the same field as those healthy plants. Aren't we supposed to steer clear of evil? We don't like a dirty field in the ground or in our lives. Now, initially, it kind of sounds like this parable is about the church, and, and it kind of is, but it's really more about us individually, about how, how to be God's people, how to be church. We want a 100% all-wheat church. We don't need any of those dastardly weeds. But we are, both as a church and individually, a tangle of wheat and weeds. We are members of an imperfect body, made perfect through the grace of God. Now, within our circles, we have conservatives and liberals. We have true believers and barely hanging on. We have the morally impure and the morally pure-ish. And Jesus says, let them grow together. Because if you start casting people out, you're going to throw out the good with the bad. And we may find ourselves on the short end of that stick. It's kind of an interesting way to look at the church, especially as earlier this year we looked at LBGTQIA plus rights. And it is possible that Jesus is telling us that he wants our weedy field of Methodism to just keep growing together, even though... We are pretty sure that the weeds must have been sown by the enemy. Progressives believe they are the wheat and the conservatives are the weeds. Conservatives feel they are the weed and the progressives are the weeds. But Jesus says, no, let them grow together. And then Jesus explains this parable. And it's that one other time that Jesus makes it clear for those disciples who really had the courage to ask Jesus what he meant. He says the field in the parable is the world and not the church. Understanding the realities of the kingdom life helps us focus on what is the most crucial. And that is our citizenship in God's kingdom and the realities of, of kingdom life. And there's, there's three things I really want us to, to remember out of this. We need to first understand that Christians and non-Christians coexist in the world. And they always will. The people of the Christian church and the people of, this, of the world are going to progress through this life together. And knowing this is very helpful for both groups. It's a warning for us as the church to avoid compromise with worldly philosophies that are unacceptable to God. And also that the church must avoid seeking isolation from worldly people. So the church is to be in the world, but not be of the world, just as Jesus modeled in his life. Coexistence is also a wake-up call for non-Christians. Togetherness does not mean sameness. The wheat and the weeds are very different, just as the people of the world and the kingdom are very different. And we see how this manifests today in the form of Black Lives Matter, wearing a mask, the individual rights we have for going out to dinner and shopping and travel. And what are we going to call that football team in Washington or that baseball team in Cleveland? It's my hope and prayer that our churches will walk on the side of love and caring on these issues to peacefully coexist. Now, we also know that Christians and non-Christians often look alike, certainly externally. You line up a dozen people, and you cannot tell by looking at their faces who is a Christian believer and who is not a believer. They may work at the same office or factory. They may live on the same street or be involved in the same community activities. Both groups are affected by the norms of their culture. Can you tell from these pictures, are any of these people Christian, or are they all? And what is it that forms your opinion? In the same way, the wheat and the tare, when they are just growing, they look very much the same. 
It's not until they reach maturity that their true nature is revealed. Reaching maturity takes time. It takes that patience that many of you have confessed is very hard for you. Ripping out the weeds risks ruining the maturing wheat as well. And so we wait. We live with the wheat and the weeds until the day of the harvest that they may be separated at the right time. But let's look at this, this problem from real life examples. There are difficult choices like choosing between getting an extra job to support the family or staying at home for more family time. Choosing between the best school you've been accepted to or one that you can afford that has different academic standards. Choosing between two different treatment options for cancer. Or staying where things are comfortable or moving to someplace newer or an unknown. Or between giving into peer pressure because you don't want to be left out or choosing to stick to your values and risking isolation. Do you see what I mean? No matter what age, our lives are full of situations where there is no clear or easy answer. And the answers are never yes or no, binary. It's not a straight line. They're all influenced by all kinds of factors. These are the questions that Christians and non-Christians face equally. All of our life is mingled like the wheat and the weeds. And I hear in the parable Jesus promised that in challenging situations, we have the promise that in the end, God will sort things out. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is just always going to turn out fine. The promise here is not that Christian faith prevents hardship. The promise is that we are, just, that we are not justified by our right choices. We are justified by grace through faith knowing that we have a God's unconditional love in spite of our poor choices. It's not the external appearance of sameness, but the internal, unique kingdom relationship that holds our destiny in our hearts. And that brings us to the real difference, the third thing that I want us to remember, the real difference between the wheat and the weeds, the Christians and the non-Christians. And it has nothing to do with our life here. It's our eternal difference. Christians and non-Christians will not look alike forever. A separation will come. And just as the wheat is separated from the weeds in the harvest, Christians will shine like the sun, while the non-believers will suffer eternal destruction. The final reality of kingdom life helps us realize what is most crucial is the new citizenship that comes through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As believers and followers of Christ, we will be harvested with the wheat. And any weeds that are tangled in our soul, because we all have them, will be purged from us. So there are a couple of urgent admonitions I want us to remember from this parable. First of all, it's not enough to just look like a Christian, whatever that means. You know that expression that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. Christianity means surrendering your life to Jesus. And second, we are supposed to do all that we are able to share Christ with as many as we can. And it is the greatest gift you can give someone. Now with that in mind, you may remember that in last month's newsletter, I asked for people who would be willing to do a porch devotion on a topic of social importance that is, is an issue that is, is relevant for you. And this was Jody doing her her porch devotion that we did of quarantine encouragement. But this new question about social issues, that's a real broad scope. 
and I offer you to be, it could be anything you want to talk about, environment, community, connections, peace and justice, equality, anything. Well, I was surprised. Nobody jumped on that. Not one person said, I'll do that. The silence was so deafening, you would have thought I had asked you to pray in public. Okay. So I'm going to say that topic was just too broad to get our minds around. Or maybe you thought it was too political. But I have been encouraging us, I think every week since I have been here for three years, going on my third year, I have asked you every week to share Christ's love. Would you, would you say that I've, I've done that? I've asked you to share Christ's love. Okay, so to help us do that, I'd like to, for our, our next round of porch chats, I want to ask you the question, why do you love Christ? Why are you a Christian? When did you decide to follow Christ? Why is the church connection important to you? And especially in this time when we have, are not connected in the same way that we have been in the past. How is your life better because you love Jesus as your Savior? Our last round of videos was very well received by people all over the country. So this opportunity lets us be the wheat in the field and testify to the goodness of God for the world stage. I know you're scared to talk to your neighbor about your relationship with God, but if we do this on the video, you can share with the world. Okay? Your testimony can bring another person to redemption in Christ. And you think, oh, I don't have anything to say. But you do. Your story is unique. Your relationship with Christ is unique. Your testimony can help someone find reconciliation with others and with God. Your testimony is like fertilizing the wheat and witnessing to the goodness of God. You know, we still don't like the way that our garden looks when it has a bunch of weeds. But in the garden of our lives, Jesus calls us to cultivate the wheat and nurture the wheat and to continue to grow in spite of the wheat spite of the challenges. So I wonder if you will nurture the wheat. Amen? Amen. Wait. All right. I skipped over, Jeff, the um, children's message that I wanted to do today. And I know we don't have kids here today, but I, that's really something I want to include. So I'm going to step over here and we're going to have a children's word, okay? So we, we just talked about how the wheat and the weeds grow together in the field, right? And I had to look away. So, I mean, we live in Wheatland, but which was like wheat territory for a long time. But I had to look a while before I found a farmer who actually grows wheat now. It's just, just not as productive a crop or as, as a profitable crop. But the wheat and the, they're the same color. They, they both have a... Uh, head at the top, they all they have little spikes, some of them coming out. So mm -hmm. it is hard to tell the difference just at a glance. But there's one way that I know that I've got wheat. When wheat is mature, it does something that the weeds don't do. And I don't know if you knew this, but this is another one of those farming things that I have learned. When wheat is mature, it it bends over. Okay. And it is, it, it, I cut this a little bit sooner than it's truly right, but it bends over, and it's almost as though it is bowing to God. And I look at the wheat and I say, that wheat is bowing to God. I want to be wheat like that. The weeds, on the other hand, they just stay upright. I'm so proud. It's all about me. Okay? So that's the difference, is that the weeds... Don't give it up for God. The wheat does. So I want to be the wheat. How about you? Let's be the wheat. Okay? And as a reminder for you, we have a stock of wheat for everybody that you can take home. And it's just another one of those things to be a reminder that I'm going to be the wheat. I'm 
get a bow to God. Okay? All right. As we conclude our worship, we uh, have our offering plate at the door. You are certainly invited to share your offering there. And I'd like us to join in our offering prayer. Mighty God, our comfort and strength, we offer our gifts to the work of your kingdom. Remind us that we are all your children. We are all your heirs. May these gifts and the gift of your love in our lives be used to choke away the weeds of discontent that are sowed today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And let's stand for our closing song. This is an older one that you may have sung at the close of worship at some other time. So. Share the word. Amen. God.